Hello, welcome. Hope you're going well. So today's session is going to be a little different to the ones we usually do in the sense that I'm not really going to be doing any live coding. A lot of homework will be on you guys to, to read through the code, make sure that it makes sense. But what I really want to discuss is the, the big picture because we've been writing code and it's been just a few objects, but then as we write more and more code, our system's going to get bigger and bigger, and it may be useful to organize our code in a particular way. So what I've got at the moment is a few notes. Now these patterns sort of exist on a spectrum from sort of very beginner friendly, very human readable to more machine like. And where you end up on this is totally up to you. So we'll just take it one step at a time. All right, so the simplest case for organizing code is to organize the code into classes and to, it's, it's sort of naive, I'm not gonna bash it, but to put as much information for each object into its class. So for instance, if we look at a cube, it would make sense to store the position of the cube and the rotation of the cube. But what we could also do is store drawing information about the cube, like the cube's mesh and material in that class and give it its own draw function, which does OpenGL stuff. So you have the cube class and it just holds all of the cube stuff, even, yeah, even the drawing stuff. So this has the benefit that it's very encapsulated, like all the stuff is there, it's in one spot. And like I said, I'm not gonna bash it because if you're just starting out and you're just making little demos because you wanna learn OpenGL, yeah, it's not optimal, but there's nothing wrong with this approach. If it gets you started, if it gets that friction out of the way, gets you coding. Anyway, so, I'll now go through a little demo of this approach. Okay, so here we are in just the, the super naive case. Let me just run it. All of these are gonna look the same. We're simply gonna have a cube, which will be spinning around and we'll have a, a first person camera. Mouse control is a little weird, but it more or less works. So we can get up close. Okay, that's great. So, okay, cool. Um, there we go, escape to exit. So super, super quickly, we have this main function and then we have a camera and a cube. Now, if we look at the cube, oh, there we go, okay. So the cube, uh, there we go, we can construct it and we can update and draw it. That's it, send it a message to update, it does its thing, send it a message to draw itself, it does its thing, it handles its own texture and mesh, it loads those in. And then, I mean, yeah, when we go to draw, all of the drawing logic is encapsulated there. So again, sort of logical, maybe not the best as the project scales up. Having said that, it's still a pretty good first approximation, I would say. All right, so there we have it. That is the, obviously, uh, honestly, the most naive way of doing it. Now, one step away from that, and this is still sort of, we're still within the realms of what you would see in a standard university programming course, is something called model view controller. So it was a little strange that our cube was including information on how to render a cube. That was a little weird. So the next step beyond that is model view controller. We have model classes, which really, just represent logical objects in the scene. And we have a scene object, which sort of manages these. So it has references to all the objects and handles their interactions. So that's all like the game logic is handled there. And then we have view classes, which um, basically involved in rendering things. So all your, all your OpenGL objects would be their own little view classes. Like you've got a mesh class, you've got a, whoops, a mesh class, you've got a material class and all of that. Okay, so that sits sort of independent of the game logic. 
So I say that again, the rendering sits independent of the game logic. And then you have a controller and the controller is really a bridge between these two aspects. So we've got a, a pointer to a scene which manages all your game logic. We've got a pointer to a renderer, which is gonna render everything. And then the controller will sort of take in keyboard input and mouse input and send pass messages to the game logic to tell it to update. And it will grab the game objects, throw them at the renderer and say, draw these things. And for most cases, this is a pretty good sort of happy medium you still get object oriented design if that's what you want. And you, what am I thinking? You still get some decoupling of the classes, which should improve the performance a little bit. So let's see that in action. Okay, so now we're back in the same project, but MVC style. So you can see here we have a model folder, a view, and a controller. Inside the model, we've got a camera and cube, and those are managed by this scene object. I won't be going super in detail here. Please do check it out in your own time if you're interested. In the view, we have the mesh class, the material class that's separate from those other objects now, as well as a renderer, which sort of runs the whole show. And this shader file holds the routines for loading in shaders. Okay, then we have this controller and the controller has an app. And if we have a look at the main function, now things have gotten quite a bit simpler. We just make a new app, tell the app to run, and then delete. In the end, the app handles other things like, you know, keyboard input and stuff, but I'll leave that for now. So again, just to check, we run this and there we go. We have our cube, just the same as before with the same weird mouse controls. Okay. Okay, so that's that. Now I'm going to have a look at this next one. This is sort of the, the hot topic at the moment. This is one of the most popular um, frameworks or design patterns. It's called Entity Component System. Now, it's not a system <laughs> involving entities and components, just like model view controller are the three different categories of classes, entities, view, uh, sorry, entity, components, and systems are the three fundamental building blocks of an ECS system. So we've been doing all this stuff, but there are two problems with the model view controller. One of those is, let's say, let's say for instance that well, we're working with object oriented stuff. So we can have multi-level inheritance. We can have multiple inheritance, all that sort of stuff. That's fine from a design standpoint, but from a performance standpoint, the larger our inheritance trees are, the worse the performance is. Like there are these little indirection lookups and things which just slow things down. And then there's an even more important case and that is, of course, the memory layout of our system. So imagine we've got all our RAM. There it is. It's sitting there. And we've got a bunch of variables. Like, let's say we have uh, position and then health and then rotation and then ammo and things. Like, we've got a whole bunch of different attributes because we're representing an object and an object is holding. It's like a bag. It's holding all of these things. Now... When we grab an attribute, the CPU doesn't just grab that single number. It has a mechanism working under the hood, it grabs what's called a cache line. Or in other words, it grabs a chunk of memory adjacent to that address that we just requested. And it loads that chunk of memory into a cache. And what that means is that any of these numbers can now be accessed in a super quick time to the to the order of several clock cycles as opposed to you know several tens of clock cycles to go back to ram and fetch a new number and that's great for x y and z but what if we've got another object 
It's got all the other stuff here. And we just want to update the object's position. So of course, we go to RAM, we fetch a cache line, and then we go to RAM again, because this next X is outside of that cache line. So what happens is that every fetch has a large data stride to the next attribute that we're interested in. And on average, every memory access is more expensive. On the other hand, let's say that we are just storing positions for all our objects and so on and so on. So when we go and grab the position of one object, we'll grab a cache line and that will include the position of the next object. If we, depending on the size of the cache, we can grab several objects positions now because the data is, is closer to each other in memory. So that means we grab this one and it takes a bit of time because we go to RAM, but then we get all this other stuff for free. So then all these other memory accesses are super, super quick. So that is the main benefit of entity component system. Okay. So here's the idea very briefly. We have an entity and an entity is just an unsigned integer. It represents well, basically plays a role of a primary key in a database. We don't think of like cameras and cubes and things. We just think of like, this is object one, object two, object three, just the ID. Then we have components and components are just data. So for instance, an object could have a transform component, which is a struct, which holds, I guess, a VEC3 for position and rotation. That's it. And so as we make a whole bunch of objects, for every object that has a transform component, we'll be writing off some VEC3s to memory. And we'll just have an array of, of all of those positions and rotations and nothing else. No wasted data. The data is as tightly packed as possible. Okay. And we could have... Uh, I've written here appearance in my version, I actually call it a render component, but it's really just two unsigned integers, one for the material index, one for the mesh index. That's it. Then we have a camera component, which just stores the fundamental vectors. And then for updates, we'll have velocity and Euler velocity for spinning around. That's a different thing. So our game engine will have four arrays. And in those arrays, we have this binary data. It's all very tightly packed. And it isn't even an array, actually. I'm using an unordered map, which has the advantage of being pretty easy to work with and having very fast lookup time. Constant, in fact. Okay, so we've got entities, we've got components, and then we've got systems. Now, components are just the raw data. But a system is basically a custom little function, custom bit of logic that takes in, you know, any of these components and operates on them. So for instance, the motion system will take in all of the physics and transform components, and it will use the information in the physics components to update the transform components. That's it. It's an unordered map. The primary key for the unordered map is the ID of the entity. And so we have constant lookup time. So we can look through the physics objects and say, hey, for every entity in here, update the corresponding entities transform. That's it. Okay. And similarly, we'll have a camera system that takes a single camera component and transform because we're going to need to read the camera's position and we'll have a render system. So that takes the, um, all the transform data, all the render components, and together it has enough state, enough information to render them out to the screen with OpenGL. So hopefully that made sense. Let's jump into the code, take a little more time on this one because it's, it's new, it's important. Okay, so finally here we are in the entity component system approach. Um, so I'll just, 
mm, close all of this down and we'll have a look through it. Okay, so to start with, we have, well, we have entities, but remember entities are just integers. So if we look at the app, the way this app works is we keep track of the number of entities which have been spawned. I'm not worrying about deleting entities at the moment because this is such a simple example, but we have this method make entity. And what that does is pretty much it just increments that entity count and returns the value before incrementing. So when we call it, it'll be going zero, one, two, just like that. Okay, so we've got that, but then we need components. So if we were to look at this main function, in order to make a cube, first up, we grab an ID for the cube, and then with the app, we register a transform component. Now, a transform component is just as simple as, like I said, it's a struct, it just holds the basic data. So we've got our transform component, We've got a camera component here. That's just the fundamental direction vectors and up uh, physics component for updating things and a render component holds the um, indices of things that we need to draw. Okay, great. So registering these objects is just as simple as basically adding those to the unordered maps, which store the, the various components. Now, if I head over to the app, right down the bottom, whoops, maybe not that far, yeah. So the keys here are these unsigned integers, those are the entity numbers, and the values are the um, those structs. So yeah, there we have our, our various components. With the camera component, there's only one of those, because there should only be one camera, at least in this case. Right, so it's just as simple as, as reading and writing to those. Now, on the other hand, we also have the systems. So we see down the bottom, we have various systems for handling things. For instance, if I pop into the, let's go motion system. The motion system has an update function, which just takes all of the transform components and physics components I'm going to make the assumption that everything with a physics component also has a transform component. That seems pretty logical. So what we can do is loop through the physics components. And then remember, because this is an unsigned, uh, sorry, because this is an unordered map, when we loop through it, we get a pair, we get a key value pair. So that's what this first is doing. That's accessing the entity number, the ID, basically. We can use that as a key into the transform components. So for a given physics component, say its entity is seven, we access in, you know, the seventh element here, because it's an unordered map, we, it's not going to mess up. And yeah, we write to the uh, position and rotation, do all our normal stuff. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. But just as an example, if we look at the render system, in its update function, takes in the transform components and render components, and it pretty much does a GL draw call for each of those. So we go through, we look at the associated transform, build up the model matrix, send that to the shader, then look at the render component to bind the appropriate texture and vertex array, and then do a draw call. Okay, so Hopefully that wasn't too brief. Look at the code to get more detail on how that was implemented, but let's just verify that it works. And in fact, it does. We have the same mouse movement. There we have it. So this has been a super brief overview of a number of very common design patterns. Hopefully you'll be able to pick your favorite pattern and work with it. But anyway, Hope you had fun, and yeah, all the best. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.